We've got Stephen M. Smith on the line from Touchdown Alabama. Join him on his show uh, the way it is uh, weekday afternoons, 2 to 4 Central Time on Fox 97.9. Texas A&M week for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, it's been an interesting series for the Aggies and the Tide since A&M with Johnny Manziel and Kevin Sumlin joined the SEC in 2012. And we expected, based on the first sample there in Tuscaloosa with Johnny Manziel at the controls, that it would be a much more interesting series because A&M had, up until about a year or two ago, recruited almost to the level, almost to the level of Alabama. Of course, that 2012 game, mighty historic. Not that it was a huge, enormous upset from a point spread standpoint, but it uh, marked the true emergence of Johnny Manziel as one of the great college quarterbacks of all time and won him the Heisman Trophy and derailed, uh, we thought at the time, Alabama's quest to win another national championship, but the Tide got back on track and had some losses uh, on the national scene play into its favor. The 2013 game was a 49-42 shootout. Uh, I'm sure, Stephen, you remember that well with uh, Johnny Manziel doing his thing. And um, in addition, it wasn't necessarily as close as the final score would indicate, but of course, Manziel and Evans kept a and M in the game, and and since then, really, 2014. When we look at the uh, 59 nothing shellacking, that was after the Aggies had won five consecutive games, and now that's become a trend. But at that point, we thought that the program had really taken off, and they they beat somebody the week before, like a Mississippi State, uh, or somebody along those lines. No, I think Mississippi State actually knocked off the Aggies that year, but Texas A&M had a big win a week or two prior to the Alabama game that kind of marked what they thought was going to be their emergence to challenge Alabama, and then it was that 59 nothing blowout. Uh, we've got the 2015 game in which uh, the Aggies and the Tide, uh, let's see, that was the uh, uh, 41-23 game, and then we had the Trevor Knight game uh, last season in which uh, Texas a and played rather well, actually had a kick return that I believe they took a, a momentary one-point lead in the third quarter, like 14-13, to 13 before Alabama put on the throttle in the fourth quarter against Miles Garrett and company. So what comes to mind when you think about this short series with Texas A&M? Because we expected so much after that Johnny Manziel year in 2012 and then the, the shootout at Kyle Field the next year, and it's it's kind of fizzled since then. It's fizzle, but it's still competitive. I mean, aside from the 59 to nothing beatdown, of course, it's still been a very competitive series. And, uh, you know, this week is a special week. Jalen Hurts goes home to Texas. You know, Jalen Hurts from Houston, Channel View, but Kevin Sumlin courted him hard in the recruiting process. Kevin Sumlin wanted Jalen Hurts to be a Texas A&M Aggie. Now, it did not happen, but... I'm pretty sure this week in practice has been an intense week for Kevin Sumlin and, and John Chavis trying to figure out ways to limit you know, Jalen Hurts' running ability, force him to beat you throwing the football. Now, Jalen Hurts in the passing game has improved uh, quite a bit. I saw him against Ole Miss, really went through some reads, some progressions quite well, especially on some throws to Jerry Judy, uh, a throw to Cam Sims that went for 60 yards a throw to uh, Joshua Jacobs, which was the little throwback kind of swing pass play that went for a touchdown, and even the throw to Henry Ruggs, the third, that Ruggs should have caught in the back of the end zone. Uh, Jalen Hurts rolling to his right, throwing an absolute dart to Ruggs. Ruggs trying to slide and make the catch, just could not bring the ball in. But, you know, just some instances where Jalen showing the progression letting you know that he can go from read one to read two uh, to option three and so forth. So th this is a homecoming for Hurts. He's coming back to Texas. He's playing in a big-time football game. But what, what I've enjoyed about Alabama, Texas, A&M, Mark, is that it's, it's always competitive. You, you never know what happens. When you go down to Kyle Field and those fans are swaying back and forth in the midnight Aggie yell. It's just an absolute cult down there. And then when the game starts, the press box shakes, and there's a warning on everybody's seat inside the press box that goes warning of the press box may shake, and you're going, ah, oh, man, that's just some baloney. It's not going to happen. And it actually happens, and you're trying to find yourself hiding underneath the table because you did not expect this to occur. So – 
it, it's always something special when you travel to Kyle Field because you're going to get both dinner and a show. And in this case, this year, you're hoping for a competitive football game. And, you know, you know someone, he needed to get to four and one after the colossal meltdown against UCLA to make himself feel good and to put this team in a better situation. And, and it has not been easy. It was a fight to beat Nickel State. It was a fight to beat, you know, Louisiana Lafayette, now simply called Louisiana. Uh, you get a win over South Carolina, uh, which was huge. So now you finally got yourself back in the base where, okay, we're four and one. We're going up against Alabama. Can we make this game as competitive as possible? The point spread is 26, which is unbelievable. But can you make this game as competitive as possible? And, and for, for Texas A&M, you know, it, for, defensively, they've got to win first down. I know that's kind of a universal rule for all defenses, but you have to win first down because facing Alabama on second and eight or third and seven is a lot more easier than facing Alabama on second and four or third and two because on second and four or third and two, Mark, the playbook for Brian Dable becomes open. Everything becomes accessible. The run pass options become limitless and he can attack you from a different number of ways versus third and eight or second and seven where the playbook kind of shrinks a bit. There's not a lot of plays you can call and the plays you can are calling are dictated by the defense and what they are showing you. So uh, for AM, number one, the ability defensively to win on first down. Number two, Kellen Mond has got to be exceptional. The quarterbacks, the teams that have beaten Alabama in years past have had exceptional quarterback play, and they've had the ability to run the ball and pass the ball just enough to keep that Alabama defense off balance. You don't have to be a world beater at doing either of the two, but you have to do both of them exceptionally well enough that it keeps something in the back of the mind of the Alabama defense. So that's number two. Kellen Mond has to be exceptionally playing well, and you have to be able to be balanced to just enough, just enough of the extent to keep the tide uh, guessing. And then number three, special teams. I think special teams plays a huge role in this game. Like I mentioned, Texas A&M, number one in the SEC in kickoff return yardage. Uh, Christian Kirk is explosive, but also in the punt coverage game, in the kickoff coverage game, can you pin Alabama deep? Can you force the Crimson Tide to drive the length of the field and get that crowd going early and often, giving Alabama a rough field position to work with? So winning on first down, Kellen Mond playing exceptional, bringing that balance, and then special teams, the three core areas.